you go into a supposedly a theta state and then when you open your eyes you just start writing information and all this information flows out where did it come from now that's called coordinate uh, remote viewing but there's also a remote viewing where you don't use numbers and you just close your eyes and you pretend everything is imagination anyway that you're going through this um, vortex and you you arrive at the target site and then you start looking at it you see it you can you can go up you can go down you can look at it from this perspective and you start jotting down information now the whole point is we really are all one and this is why this is possible you know they call it the akashic records they call it a lot of things but the information is out there and all we need to do is believe that we can tap into it because we can. Um, I used, I used. Uh, now, now David uh, Morehouse, he had he had um, studied for like 18. Uh, they trained him for like 18 months. I, I trained with him for five days. So you know he's really an experienced remote viewer. I'm not, but I try to help my clients when I have a lost animal. So I'll do a session with the animal first, and I'll get. Um, I'll ask the animal. Uh, how he's doing, what he sees in front of him, what he sees around him. I'll do a body scan, which I'll talk about more later, where I try and in, go into the body and I um, feel what the animal's feeling. Are they injured? Try to determine if they're dead or alive, which is not that simple. Um, you could, I, I've talked to animals before, they've told me where they were. Uh, one, one ferret <coughs> told me he was about 15 minutes south of the house and he was in a big field with butterflies and eating a lot of food and really happy and they found him he was dead and I thought wow you know I was talking to this dead ferret and I the ferret was perfectly alive in, in his non-physical body which is really interesting because there is no death really and, and I believe that from from the, from the conversations I've had with animals who have passed over uh, one I'm going off the subject here but one dog um, I tuned into and he he was dead and he told me um, I said well what are you doing now he said uh, I said are you with your siblings I just assumed that everybody's together <coughs> and he said no he, he said I see them but I'm not with them I'm on another level I says well, what are you doing he said I'm caretaking I said what are you taking care of and he told me he was um, uh, herding sheep and then he also showed me a beach and then I went back and told the people, I, I felt kind of, you know, you, you, when you do this work, you really put yourself on the line because, you know, you have to be confident and trust yourself because, you know, you can look like a real nut. <laughs> so I went back and said, you know, your dog told me he's herding sheep. And she said, wow, you know, we always took him her, her sheep herding. It was one of his favorite pastimes and he loved the beach. We took him to the beach. So the dog was continuing on with his jobs. And he was perfectly happy in, the, in, his, in his next life. And I saw him with a woman. And uh, she, the woman, the person, thought that it might have been her grandmother. So anyway, so, um, uh, so remote viewing, uh, I think I'm off re remote viewing now. So, so, <laughs> so now I'm, um, I lose my chain of thought all the time. Excuse me. Okay, so now I just want to cover one more thing, the power of your thoughts, and then, and then talk about some case studies. Again, quantum physics, um, they found that when you try to observe one of these waves, you couldn't, because as soon as you observed, observe, observed it, it became a particle, a matter. So what they're finding now, quantum physicists are saying that, in fact, our thoughts are where we place our intention where we put our, con our consciousness um, sets the unset jello. We're the ones that set it. So in fact, we create our reality with our thoughts. I mean, this is like, um, this, they're not even bringing this out into the schools yet. You know, the, the school system is still teaching their children um, the old physics. This is going to take a while before they, I mean, it's common knowledge, but it's going to take an, uh, a while before it really hits the mainstream. But anyway, uh, um, the point being, uh, and they're finding like when you, when someone's attention, when you focus your intention, focus intention in, in a healing sort of way is called prayer. And they show how it works. They took AIDS patients and those that were prayed for, uh, 
healed faster, they, they had less trips to the doctor, they had uh, less hospital visits, less medication. And then they've even explored the placebo effect when you thought that this was going to help you, you got better, tumors disappeared, you know, all, all this fascinating stuff. So our thoughts are so, so powerful. And this is what um, we need to really watch our thinking, our emotions, watch our, um, uh, our negativity, our stress when we're around our animals because they do, they do pick it up. Pippi and Melissa. Pippi was a little dog who had arthritis and no longer wanted to play in the park. And um, Melissa came to me in tears, you know, and she was so upset that her dog didn't have this, the same quality of life, and um, she, was, she, she cried through the whole, the whole session. So I tuned in to uh, Pippi, and I didn't feel any pain in Pippi's body at all. And I, I said, um, you know, she had medication. She said, and she said, yes, she is. I said, well, it's, it's working because Pippi is not in pain, and there's really no reason why she's not playing in the park. So then I looked at Pippi's emotional centers. I, I look at the, the chakra centers, you know, um, the energy centers in the body. Uh, and her energy centers that were off were exactly like Melissa's. So I said to Melissa, I said, you know, your dog is picking up on your sadness and your thoughts about her not playing in the park and about her not having a good quality of life and so forth and so on, you've got to lighten up. And Melissa did. She changed her attitude. She called me two weeks later and said, Pippi's running around in the park like she always did because before she was just sitting by Melissa. So our, you know, our animals do this for us. This is an interesting one. Uh, I'll call the cat Garfield and the woman Pamela. I worked on this case, a lost case, lost animal worked on this recently. Uh, Garfield has not been found. Um, Garfield showed me where he was and I got a direction and distance away. One thing Garfield said to me was, you, you can find me at the old house. So I talked to um, Pamela and she says, well yeah we did move but the old house is 34 miles away. There's no way he could have gone back there. She lives on a thousand acres of, um, or not a thousand acres, but many acres of uh, woods. And then he would have had to go all through that, plus, you know, cross streets and, well, you know, the cat's been gone a month. I said, you know what, just for the heck of it, post some signs in your old neighborhood. Anyway, uh, Garfield gave me all this information. Well, usually, um, I ask the animal why they left. But this time I was so excited about really focusing on where the animal was, I forgot to ask him why he left. So the, do the cat's not being found. I uh, tossed it out to a colleague of mine. We do that a lot. We'll help each other. You know, I'll say, you know, what are you getting with, with, uh, with Garfield, you know, here? 